Hello, and welcome to the You Know How to Live show. My name is Kate Hammer, and in just a moment, we will have Carly Riordan with us. Carly is a full-time blogger and soon-to-be first-time author with Penguin Random House, debuting her book, Business Minded, on November 23rd. A graduate of Georgetown University's undergrad business school, Carly turned her blog into a legitimate, successful business and now offers everything you need to know to turn your creative passion into a successful company. Today, we're going to talk to her about how she did it and how you can pull from Carly's bag of tricks. Wherever you're listening or watching from, I'm so glad that you tuned in and are hanging out. I hope that you are ready for my favorite combination of things, hopefully a bit of entertainment, and of course, some takeaways to improve how you work and play and do everything in between. Please take a moment right now to subscribe, follow, leave a comment, or give a five-star review so that we can stay connected. And with that, let's bring in Carly Riordan. Carly, thank you so much for making time to come hang out and share a little bit about who you are and this new awesome book that you have coming out November 23rd, Business Minded. And sharing with us a little bit about what your day-to-day looks like habits, what works well for you, and how you go from sharing that as an influencer and on your blog into in the space of an author. So I would say right now my life looks so much different than it did this time last year, just because about or two months ago I had my son. So life is kind of crazy, just like trying to get into a rhythm. Um, But I would say I definitely have like implemented a lot of daily habits that I've brought with me throughout like a lot of stages of my life, which I think is really important. Um, So they're kind of things that keep me grounded and outside of work and outside of the stressors of life. So I always try to practice French for 15 minutes every morning, which is like a sort of new thing I've done over the past couple of years. I try to meditate. Well, I do meditate every day. I work out or try to get movement in. Just try to keep like well-rounded habits that get me away from my computer and my phone because I spend so much time for my work on my computer and my phone. Mm -hmm. So I find that those things are so important to like look forward to that are just for me. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's dig into that a little bit about what you do with your phone. So how do you prevent it from happening? Because we know it's this like super addictive situation. So how do you keep your phone out of your face? The re- the truth is that I don't. Um, before the pandemic, the one thing that I would do frequently was go to the movie theater and I don't even know if I really enjoyed watching movies so much as I enjoyed being in a room where I was forced to turn my phone off for two hours and like (laughs) focus on something else. Yeah. Um, Obviously haven't really been able to do that as much now really at all. Um, I wish I was better about putting my phone down. I think it's hard because it is such a huge part of my life, of my work life. And so my life is also such a huge part of my work. And so it's all mixed and it's very hard to separate. And I try to make a conscious effort of doing that. But the reality is I feel like I almost have to be kind of tethered to my phone because, you know, my coworkers essentially are my management team. They're based in LA. So I always have to be in touch with them. And, um, just being on social media is part of the job and capturing my life with my phone and camera. So, you know, if I find myself that I am reaching for for my phone too much and I'm just doing like a refresh to see like, oh, how many more DMs do I have to respond to today? Mm -hmm. That's actually when I find myself like wanting to take a step back is when when I feel that overwhelming wave come crashing over me. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. all right, I need to take a step back. Yeah. Do you ever physically separate yourself from your phone, like leave it in some particular area of the house you're not in? Nope. No. (laughs) I think I have like actual anxiety. So I think this is sort of a new thing because um, like as a person on social media, I'm always afraid that something's going to happen in the world yeah. where like I shouldn't be posting. So I actually have this like compulsion to like know what's going on in the news. Mm-hmm. And I've been, 
especially at the beginning of the pandemic, I was like doom scrolling on Twitter just to make sure like the, it was like every hour something really dramatic was happening. And yeah, you know, was it appropriate to even be posting about like I didn't want to be the person, you know, sharing a superfluous link to like a cute outfit when like a tragedy was happening in the world. And so, oh, yeah, yeah I actually started signing up for the New York Times push alerts. Yes. Mm-hmm. Just so that it actually, even though it sounds like crazy to add more alerts to your life, mm-hmm. it actually helps me because it doesn't make me feel like I need to go seek out the alerts. They come to me when they happen and that helps. But I would say my phone is almost always within reach. <laughs> yes. Okay. Fair enough. So let's actually talk about alerts for a second because you bring up a good point. They can be super yeah. abundant or not, depending on how you tailor them. Do you have, uh, outside of New York Times, do you have specific applications that you allow push through notifications? So on Instagram, I actually allow all comments, which sounds insane. That's a lot. I like, it is a lot. <laughs> yeah. But I really, I get, I get so much hate, honestly, that I like to see when comments are rolling in, because if I get a negative comment, I can immediately delete it like within seconds and it doesn't even, it doesn't get airtime, so to speak. Mm. Um, so that really helps me. And I like to just be in touch with like what people are or how people are responding to my content. Mm-hmm. But because I get the, the notifications so frequently, I'm actually pretty good about tuning them out. It's not like the New York Times where when I see that, I'm immediately going to stop and like figure out what's going on. Yeah. The Instagram comments are just kind of like background noise, Mm -hmm. like putting on like TV in the background while you're working. It's like, it's there, but you have no idea really what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have, I have um, notifications for some text messages. Oh, okay. You filter some. I mute. Almost everyone. And it's mostly because I just like can't Mm -hmm. break up my workflow. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like obviously I want to know if my husband's texting me. Mm -hmm. And I'm usually I have text messages on my computer. So if I'm on my computer, I see him there. But like as far as my phone goes, I just my mom I have on, obviously. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Anyone you need to know about emergency situations, right? Exactly. Exactly. But otherwise I'm like, it's okay if it goes five minutes without responding. Yeah. You know, and I'm on my phone so frequently, I feel like I don't actually miss that much. So totally. (laughs) Okay. So you've developed a lot of strategies over the years to streamline things, to be able to keep focus. Uh, A lot of what you write about in your book is challenges that came up over time that you realized, okay, I need a way to navigate this. I need to change things up a little bit. Uh, One question that I thought of when I was reading the book is, what would you tell 2008 Carly when you are just about to launch this blog? And I think there's like some context that has to be before I say what I'm going to say, which is when I started my blog in 2008, I was no question at like the lowest of lows in terms of my life. And so I was really grasping at straws for something outside of school where I was really struggling from a social perspective and an academic perspective and outside of the crew team, because I was, you know, a student athlete as well. I needed something that was just for me. Mm. So I think there's a little bit of an irony to it that I had created something just for me that was being consumed or would ultimately become consumed by hundreds of thousands of people. Um, Really more than that. If you add like all the blog hits up over 13 years and there is something funny about why I chose a blog, you know, why didn't I choose like reading or something where like that would just have been an experience for me. And I chose this thing I needed a creative creative outlet for myself, and yet I chose something that was going to just be seen by millions of people and shared with millions of people. And I had no idea that that was where I was going. But I think I would look back and really tell myself, like, you have a really, really strong gut intuition. And I don't think I really valued that 
even though I felt things and would like feel strong pulls in certain directions. And it took me a really long time to like hone in on that. But I, I really do feel like I've always kind of had a good sense for these types of things. And I wish I had been able to like, you know, cue the radio antenna a little bit more so I could really hone in on it earlier. I think I would have been better off. Like maybe this person isn't even a good friend, or maybe that's not the person you should be dating. Mm. Maybe this is a job where you should be like, (laughs) I think I always had those feelings. I just ignored it, (laughs) but I had a good intuition. And I think starting my blog when I started, it was just kind of cracking into that for the first time. And I look back and I'm like, yeah, I definitely felt like this was what I should have been doing. Mm. I had no idea where it was going to lead, but it ended up being the best thing that could have happened. Yeah, absolutely. So that whole concept of self-trust, like believing that you know what's going on. Oh man, that's, I feel like we do kind of have to just redevelop that after the teenage years because we are just constantly having to second guess and wonder like everything externally is telling us like question yourself, you don't know. So that is actually, I mean, I, I can't remember exactly which chapter, but it's early in the book mm-hmm. where I talk about tuning out other people because maybe not everyone, but even people that you trust, they might not understand your vision for a business. Mm-hmm. And I had, I can't think of really many people who were like fully supportive of what I was doing. I think there was a lot of people, including my parents who were like, what is this? Like, why are you sharing your life with the internet? You shouldn't be talking about these things. Like your mental health is a private thing. And I just had this like deep feeling that, no, I really should be sharing this. Like it felt so important to me and I didn't know why at the time. And now looking back, I'm like, oh yeah, like this was the beginning of social media where people were sharing these things and being more vulnerable on the internet. And I just felt that like deep. Um, And I had to tune out a lot of people who didn't believe that or didn't understand it. And if I had listened to everyone who told me no, or that this was a horrible idea and it stopped, I can't imagine what my life would look like now. And I'm so glad I did listen to myself and kind of block out that noise. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I remember the part you're talking about in the book, something like just be patient when you have a new idea, like wait, wait to share it, like let it sit with you for a little. Because the minute you open your mouth and tell someone, even if you're so excited about it, there's a really good chance that person's going to look at you and say, that's a really terrible idea. Or, (laughs) well, someone else has already done it, so you shouldn't even bother. Or like there are just, everyone's going to have feedback. Even people just telling you, oh, I like that idea, but like, have you ever considered this? You might not be able to, it might be hard to block that noise out, especially when you're in the very, very early vulnerable stage Mm -hmm. of your business idea. And it can be, it can feel personal if someone shoots it down and you feel so passionate about it. Mm -hmm. So I do kind of recommend like, keep it close to the chest, like do a lot of the brainstorming, do the research, you know, call on mentors and experts like as needed, but maybe don't wear your heart on your sleeve quite so early. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Um, I also like- There's plenty of time for negativity. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, totally. So when it's time to share your idea, when you feel ready, how do you approach that conversation to let the other person know not to be hypercritical? Do you have any thoughts? I think, so I think instead of trying to control what other people are going to do, your Mm. best bet is to control what your reaction is going to be. Um, I think the first thing that you kind of have to remind yourself is that if people are giving you feedback, Mm. they're interested, which is a positive thing. Now, if you are just, if someone's just dead silent on the other end, on the one hand, great, you're not getting feedback, but on the other, they just don't care. So yeah, when you are getting that feedback, even if it hurts, and if you, even if it's not what you want to hear, it is a good reminder to just say, oh, well, okay, this person really cares about me and cares about my business and they're interested enough to like give me feedback. So I'll take that as like a gift. It doesn't mean you have to implement yeah. it, but it does kind of help soften the blow a little bit of what they're saying to you. Yeah. Maybe just really freaking annoying that they're even like giving you this feedback. So reframing yeah. it being like, oh, they, they're interested is a positive thing. 
Um, I like you describing it as a gift because there you are unwrapping it. And if you need to take it back to the store later, you can. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> gift receipt attached. Um, and the other thing too, is, you know, I do this with my friends sometimes where I just need to vent and I'm not looking for advice and just starting that off by saying, can I have five minutes to vent about something? And yeah be explicit saying, I just need this to get off my chest and vent it. I don't, I'm not in a place or a position for feedback right now, or like even advice. Like I just need to, to vent my friends. and I kind of have that with each other. Like, are you looking for advice or are you looking just to blow off steam? And I kind of feel like when you're doing your business at the end of the day, people are going to give you the advice or feedback that they're going to give you. Even if you explicitly state, you don't want it. it there's a good chance it's going to happen. Yeah. You can say, you know, I'm at the early stages. I'm not quite ready to like brainstorm or I just wanted to share my idea, but I'm not, I, you know, I feel kind of vulnerable sharing my idea. I'm not ready to like hash it out and, and pitch it to investors necessarily. Like you're just trying to tell people about your idea. Mm -hmm. Now, with all that said, it might be like a really good first exercise of what it's like to be a business owner because these type, you know, your customers are going to have feedback, your investors, if you have investors are going to have feedback, Yep. your employees are going to have feedback. It's kind of unavoidable. And I think, especially as a business owner, when you're a leader, but you're also, you're beyond just the leader, you know, you're not just managing a team of people, you're leading an entire company. It's just part of the, the job. And so I think the earlier you can kind of accept the fact that this stuff is going to happen, the better. Absolutely. This is a part of life that we're going to experience regardless if we're an entrepreneur, if we have a job and, you know, we have a manager that we're interfacing with. Um, and maybe even for some of us getting to the point where we're delivering feedback to someone who reports to us. So getting used to those conversations, like it's top of the list. You got to do it. Totally. And the yeah. other, I just thought of a tip too. Like if you don't mm. want to engage in having a conversation about it, even if you have a response or a retort for like whatever feedback, like maybe they just yeah. gave you really terrible advice and you, you're like, no, that's not how the business works. And you want to get into it the minute you get into it, you're getting into it. So mm -hmm. it might just be best, you know, when your uncle Joe at the Christmas party is telling you why your stationary calligraphy business is a terrible <laughs> idea, but he doesn't know, even know the start of, you know, he's never heard of Etsy or he doesn't know how it works. It yeah. might just be best to say, oh my gosh, thank you so much for your feedback. Like, I haven't thought about that. I'm going to keep that in mind. And yeah. By having to then go into like the whole can of worms of explaining Etsy and like, mm -hmm. no, here's my social media strategy. You can just kind of like say, thank you. Thank you for this gift of being interested in what I do. And yeah, <laughs> the gift. I love that so much. I'm going to literally picture a gift anytime I get any constructive feedback. <laughs> I mean, it's annoying. Like I feel my blood, blood pressure, like raising when like people give me feedback and especially for like what I do, yeah. people don't get that you can make money doing what I do. And so I just am like, I'm not going to sit here and explain, mm -hmm. you know, oh, you make money doing that. That's a very common question. It's like, I'm not yeah. going to sit here and explain like, you know, my quarterly tax payments and how I get paid by, I'm like, it's just not worth it telling the cashier at the grocery store, what, how it happens. And so I'm just I'm always like, yes, I do. You know, I love my job and then leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think what readers will find really interesting about the way that you format the book is you really do describe all aspects of how to do business and all the ways that a person can prepare themselves. So I imagine that if someone is a longtime reader, a fan, and they're reading it, they're going to be thinking about like, oh, how did this apply to Carly? Like, how, do, how does Carly do her finances? Like, oh yeah, like Carly must have to be making money. Like, how does this work? Um, and though you kind of apply generally all of these different areas of business, like how, you know, how somebody can create spreadsheet X or whatever. Um, I do think it sort of begs the question at like, okay, well, how does this work for you? So yeah, I wonder how many readers will be thinking like, oh, wow, like she runs a real business. This is legit. Like I could do this too. Well, and that's like, that was a big inspiration behind the book. So yeah, 
I, it was originally, it was actually two ideas that kind of got smushed together mm -hmm. after meeting with, um, publisher, book editors and publishers and stuff. And the first part of it's, it's so not what the book is, but it had started in my mind as when I was in college, honestly, and I was in the business school undergraduate program, mm -hmm. which we had all the same professors and basically the same course load. We did all the same cases that the graduate school was doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was sitting there thinking, this is so much more complicated than it actually needs to be. Um, and, and it mm -hmm. feels so intimidating because it's like business school. And, you know, you think about people going to school to like get their MBA. I know tons of people who have their MBA have never started a business. And I know tons of people who have started businesses and have never stepped, have never gone to college, maybe yep. graduate high school, maybe not even like, I just feel like there's this idea that there's this really fancy ornate gate that mm -hmm. keeps people from thinking that they belong in this space. And I, I'm, I can't tell you, like you're sitting in this classroom and you're, the textbooks are heavy and then it seems so complicated, but when you really break it down, it's like, it's not as hard as I think people think it is. It's annoying. There are tasks that you aren't going to be suited for. I hate accounting. Mm -hmm. I'll never like accounting. That's what accountants are for. Doesn't mean that I can't start a business <laughs> yeah. just because yeah. I don't enjoy accounting. Like you can figure out what you like to do and make it work for you. And originally I had wanted to write a children's book for girls to explain basically like the very fundamentals of business and for a fifth grader. And Ooh, ooh I hope that's still going to happen. I know I, I still want to do it, but I after writing this book, I need a very long break from writing books, but it, you know, this <laughs> idea that the stuff isn't that complicated and you can really apply it. Anyone can figure this out. And I wanted the book to feel approachable and to kind of demystify some of the complication yeah. about running a business and, you know, spell it out, but then also give you the tools to like work through it on your own. So if you haven't read the book, this is like just a gist of that it's basically four pages, two spreads per chapter. And the first two pages are kind of like an intro, a description of like what that chapter is about, what that topic's about. And then it's followed by a workbook type page. So you could really work through what that is for your specific business. So I didn't want someone to feel like, oh, I'm not a blogger. So like, I don't know, I don't need to know how to run a blogger business. I really a lot of these concepts, all of the concepts apply to any business where you're making money. Yes. And so it doesn't matter if you're a blogger or, you know, I talk about my mom in an early chapter about running, starting a cake pop business. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what you're doing. It can, you can use this if you want to start a business. So it's not for everyone. It's okay. If you're not an entrepreneur, which I also talked about in the book, like yeah. it's okay to keep your hobbies a hobby because once you turn your hobby into a business, it becomes business, which is that therefore a lot of work mm -hmm. and you might not be doing the stuff you really enjoy about your hobby, but you know, anyone can pick this up. If you want to start a business, especially if you just feel overwhelmed, maybe you have a business and you're like, you know, need to take it to the next level. And you felt trapped in this kind of smaller space, but you want to, you know, take totally. it to the next step. Yeah. It does really feel like this is the right book to pick up if you just have that feeling. Yes. You see other entrepreneurs out there and it's attractive to you and you're curious, but you don't know what you would do next. You're like, oh, I mean, I think I would like to pursue this, but how could I do that legitimately? Like it really helps you brainstorm through every aspect. Yes. And a big, I mean, listen, starting a business can be really expensive. Um, it might not be, but usually you're, you're going to need some sort of initial capital from the start, even if you're bootstrapping and like cutting every corner, even just, you know, filing to incorporate, it's going to cost money. And so buying a domain name could cost money, but it will cost money building even just a basic GoDaddy or, um, you know, Squarespace website is going to cost money before yeah. you commit to spending the money on starting a business. It might be helpful to like really work through some of the questions that come about starting a business that you might run into down the road 
that might be either complete roadblocks mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, turn left here, this, this exact path doesn't work and using a workbook, you don't need a workbook. I'm not telling you, you need to buy my book, but like sitting down and working through some of those questions and problems when you have that gut feeling mm -hmm. it's so much cheaper to do it before you start than at the end oh yeah or in the middle <laughs> I should say <laughs> I've definitely learned some of those lessons throughout my stretch like but at the same time you also talk about not waiting for perfect and yes. expecting things to evolve and grow and that's yeah. okay right oh yeah I mean I feel like if anything over the past year and a half has taught us anything, it's you have, it doesn't matter if you have a standard nine to five job mm -hmm. or you're starting a business. I think people have to just anticipate and expect that pivoting is crucial. Yeah. We don't live in an era anymore where like that, you know, different generations had where you got a job when you graduated college and you you step-by-step step climbed the corporate ladder until you hit retirement. And then you retired with a pension. Like mm -hmm. that is just not how the world works anymore. And I think people have to be really willing and able to be agile and flexible business or not. And, you know, you need a growth mindset to just survive in 2021. 20, oh, <laughs> yeah. I love that you said growth mindset. I, Oh, have you ever read the book Mindset by Carol Dweck? Do you? I haven't, that? but it sounds right up my alley. Oh man, you would love it. Um, but basically that idea that, you know, we're not necessarily born like smart or not smart, but that we have so much control over uh, the way that we can develop ourselves. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do love that. Um, okay, so- Moving into the other part of your book, the minded half, the second half, how do we do business well? Like, yes, we want to like get our finances in order and have a business plan and all these things, but we also want to feel good along the way and be good to ourselves and be able to show up wholly. And you really get into that in a lot of ways. Um, one of the most interesting parts to me was about your recognition of sleep which yeah. my goodness, like that's the first to go. If you start to get passionate about something, you're like, well, I'll just, you know, stay a little, up a little bit later, just get a couple extra hours in on this. But yeah. you were just like, no, this is the lesson. You must sleep. So what were your thoughts on adding that component to your book? A big reason I added it was because I had really messed that up in my own personal life. And that spilled over into my professional life where I had not been prioritizing myself and mm -hmm. I was doing it under the guise of like, I'm, you know, this was peak Pinterest, like hashtag hustle, yeah. like hashtag girl boss. Like you can sleep when you're dead, like daily grinds, like all these mottos were just everywhere. And I fell victim to that, like in a big way. And I really truly felt like if I wasn't if I didn't feel tired or feel exhausted, it was mm -hmm. almost like, well, you're not, you're not successful. You're, you're, you don't take it seriously enough. It's not a priority to you. Yeah. And I did that for, you know, and you can also get away with it in the short term. Like, yeah, you can mm -hmm. absolutely go without sleep for a little bit. You can absolutely eat terribly and not drink enough water and over caffeinate yourself. No question. Mm -hmm. The problem is that you almost get this feedback of like, oh, you know, if it's not, if it's burning, it's working. Mm -hmm. And then you are going to, no question, your body will eventually, or mind hit a point where you can't take it anymore. And mm -hmm. I hit that point kind of quite literally, you know, and I had a huge wake up call after getting very sick one time. And I realized I have not put myself first. and. I was, I think 26 and thinking to myself, oh my God, I almost felt like I, I was going to die true, not in a exaggeration standpoint, but I really felt like, oh, wow, I'm not invincible. And I've been really hurting myself by doing this. I need to get my life in order. Um, and I really wish I had known 
what I know now then, which Mm. is Mm -hmm. it feels like you're giving up productivity and your work ethic by prioritizing yourself because you're not giving a hundred percent. It feels like you're not giving a hundred percent to your business. The reality is the only way you can give a hundred percent to your business is if you're giving a hundred percent to yourself and you can't, it's a really weird mental idea to think like, oh, well, if there's 24 hours in the day and I, you know, maybe it's your side hustle and you're working eight hours and then you have your family or whatever, like, well, I need to get this done. And I have six hours of awake or between now and when I have to get up for work tomorrow, I have to use every, all of these six hours. And it's like, yeah, you're going to burn yourself out. You're not going to be passionate about what you, you do. You're, you're going to exhaust yourself. And ultimately you're not going to be able to fulfill your goal, which is to have mm-hmm. the successful business. And I was confusing small success with max success. I thought it was, I had hit the peak of what I could do because I was like, you know, just burning the candle at both ends in such an intense way. Mm-hmm. And so when I decided to prioritize myself, I really thought I was giving up my business. And to me, I was like, well, my health is so important. I I'll just yeah. put my business on the back burner. The trade in. Mm-hmm. And then I realized how wrong I had been because almost immediately I realized how much happier and healthier I was and how much more I actually could give to my business. And I was making much clearer decisions. I was working so much more efficiently. So even though I wasn't working the hours that I was working before my output was leaps and bounds beyond what I've been doing. And it was such this eye-opening experience of like, you're telling me I can work less, a fewer hours and have more outcome with a greater success and make more money, bottom line. But Mm -hmm. I feel better also, and I'm healthier and I have time to do like other things outside of just like work, work, work. Mm -hmm. It was mind blowing to me. And I really had made this decision thinking I was giving up my business. And it was a true shock to know I had actually bettered my business by bettering myself. And I wanted to scream it from the rooftops and be like, everyone (laughs) needs to know this because it seems like the opposite of what should happen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things that sometimes when you hear it, you're like, yeah, that sounds right. But you need that experience to prove it to yourself. Like, no, 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 this is true. And this is worth creating a lasting habit and doing what I need to do to show up. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so, you know, if, if you're reading this book, you can find some really specific instruction on how to do that with sleep, as you said, with movement, um, with, what you put in your body. Gosh, you used a great word to describe, um, tracking what you eat. Do you remember what it was? Um, fuel, fuel tracker. Yeah. I thought that was super genius because so often we're like, try, we're like trying to do all of this stuff. Like part of when, when we are tracking food, it's often to think about like dieting or calories. Yep. Yes. And for you, it was like, no, like, how are you helping yourself show up? Yep. And you know, I think it, as long as you know yourself and you know that tracking your food isn't going to cause like other issues. Like for me, yeah. it was such an, another eye-opening experience to realize, you know, I had been cutting all these corners because I didn't have enough time in the day. Like when I worked my job in New York, while I was also doing my blog in the middle of the night, you know, yeah, six days a week, it was insane. I felt like I was just running on a treadmill or a hamster wheel. And I didn't feel like I even had time to eat like truly. And I would go to the whole foods around the corner in union square. And every day, except for Fridays, when I'd let myself get hard boiled eggs, because they were easy and quick to eat, but I felt like they were had protein, but I would get a protein bar and a vitamin water. And I was like, I got my vitamins. I got my protein. I'm good to go. You know, the reality is I would feel horrible two hours later when like the sugar from the vitamin water left my system and Mm -hmm. the sugar from the protein bar left my system. I would have this huge crash. And I was like, I'd never really tuned into that. I would just go to the Starbucks and get a coffee and like have another quick fix. And then all of a sudden at 6 PM and it's time for dinner and I don't have time to cook. So I'm just going to eat something 
cheap and easy that I don't have to think about that makes me feel horrible two hours later and keeping track of like, well, what makes me feel good? And everybody is going to have a different experience. Like if even oh, yeah. if I gave you my ideal daily intake of food, it's yeah. not going to work for someone else, but like keeping track of like, well, what makes me feel good? Like, what do I eat at noon that at 4 PM when I then worked for, you know, from 1230 to four at my desk, like what made me feel awesome? Versus like, oh, did I like reach into like the snack drawer in the back of the office kitchen and like grab, you know, a bag of Skittles? Like, do I feel good after that? No. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's a very fleeting thing, but man, like what a worthy journey to figure out what does work for you because when you do, and I've experienced this personally, so I know exactly what you're talking about. When you do find the foods that fuel you well and you have that next level energy and like you become just so much more resilient and patient and focused. It's like, oh my gosh, how is that possible? Like, how could it be such a simple thing? I thought this is just like when you're not eating well, it's like, I thought this is just like who I am. Like, this is just my body. And it becomes your baseline and you don't know. I like, I don't even, especially when you're in it, it can be so hard to see like the forest when you're among the trees. It's like, you are, you got to, pull yourself out, which is why I really wanted to include just as many chapters in the minded section as the business section, because it is just as important. And one thing I say, like all the time in the book, in real life to every, anyone who will listen, it's like, (laughs) yeah, you can have the best idea in the world. You can have all the capital in the world, you know, to start your business you can have the work ethic to start your business. If you aren't a hundred percent healthy and like in a really good place yourself, it's not going to work. And it's because you're your biggest asset for your business. And, you know, I think people want to like romanticize, you know, having fancy storefronts and having perfect social media accounts with like branding to a T that's great. But if you're running yourself into the ground and all of a sudden you can't be a good leader and so your team is falling apart and, or you're doing everything yourself and you don't have time to post on your super fancy schmancy, perfectly branded Instagram account, (laughs) you're not going to be successful. And so it doesn't matter all the other stuff for your business because you have to be the one like at the, you know, leading the charge. And if you're not in a good position to do that, it doesn't matter how great everything else is or could be because you're almost like, you know, you haven't, you're just dead on arrival, essentially. Like you're not giving it your best, even though it looks like it from the outside. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're thinking about this book, business minded, and you're like, Hmm, is this for me? Maybe I just need one part guarantee that is not it. You need the both. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely need the both. Like Carly's been through this. I've been through this. You, and you have your own business. You have to learn how to take care of yourself there. This is like pretty much the instruction manual on how to do it. And you can tailor it to yourself. Like there's plenty of breathing room in the way you wrote it, Carly, that people are going to be able to, you know, use your suggestions, but make it work for them and be super intentional. Yeah. And, you know, when I, when I finally got the green light for it, I, the hardest part for me, or maybe not the hardest, because I wrote this while pregnant, which was very hard, but really a part that I really had to spend a lot, a lot of time was figuring out the table of contents, because that was basically the outline for the book. And I really wanted to make sure I was hitting every part of the business section, every part of the mindful section that I thought was the most relevant. Cause the reality is, again, you could go to business school and spend years learning all the ins and outs, but I was like, what do you really need to know? Yep. Like, I also felt the same way on the minded section of like, you could spend years in therapy, like, you know, dissecting every little bit of your life and going to an, a life coach and doing all these things for yourself. But like, uh-huh. what do you really need at the end of the day? And like, uh-huh. you know, that is part of the book. It's like, you need to get off the ground. You can't just like let an idea sit somewhere and like never touch it. And you shouldn't also do that to yourself of like letting perfection get in the way of the progress. And so Mm -hmm. you use this 
book as you're going along to like really get to the, the nitty gritty of what you need. Yes. Oh, yes. You don't need to be an expert in all fields of business to be an no. entrepreneur. Mm-mm. And I say that I, I kind of call out in each section, like where my strengths lie or, or don't lie. And yeah, you know, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to hire a legal team because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a lawyer and I'm going to hire an accountant because they can do what I need done in record time. That would take me weeks and a lot of years off my life if I were trying to do it myself. And so, you know, oh man, once I feel like it's all about just that first hire what, or, you know, whether it's an employee or, you a know, contractor, a contractor of some kind, once you start, you're like, oh my goodness, what else can I outsource? <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, or delegate. Yeah. I'm still learning too. Like, I think that's important of even when I feel like I have things figured out and I'm like, oh, I'm in such a great place. And then, you know, I get to like another point in my career where I feel a little bit of that squeeze and I'm like, I got to make another change. And mm-hmm. am I making the right change? And then I, I bring someone else onto the team and I'm like, why didn't I do this two years ago? Like I would have felt so much better. So it is kind of, it is an, a constant evolution and going back to the drawing board and, you know, maybe you fill out the entire book for, for your first year of business. It could be totally worth going back in and like reviewing. What did I say a year ago? Yeah. Redoing some of the sections yeah. And where you are now. So you can make better decisions moving forward. And absolutely. As I was reading it, I kept thinking like, oh, I've never thought about that. I mean, we know what we know, Yes. like, yes, this is a great place. This book is a great place to start, but I've been in business for several years and there were things that you talk about that were still new to me. Um, so, or just a different vantage point, just a yeah. different way of thinking about something. So absolutely. Yeah. I love the idea of going back to it and seeing how you've changed too. Like oh, how yeah. your priorities adjust. Yeah, definitely. All right, Carly. So I'm going to ask you this or that for a bunch of things. And we just want to hear your favorites, your preferred thing. I have some guesses about what your, your answers will be, okay. but let's just rock and roll. Okay. Would you rather read a book or listen to a playlist? Book. All right. Keep your style classic or let your style evolve? Classic. (laughs) Go on an adventure or stay in and relax? Stay in. (laughs) (laughs) Let's be honest. (laughs) Rewatch favorites or search for a new show? Rewatch favorites. Ooh, can you name one? So I love going back and rewatching Gilmore Girls. Oh, yes. I just think it's great background noise. And then I watch 10 Things I Hate About You, the movie, at least three times a week. Like I watch it a lot. Oh my God. What is it about that movie? I don't know. But I think it is like, I think it is a perfect movie and I watch it all the time. Like all right. All the time. There you have it. 10 Things I Hate About You. Okay. The more the merrier or more fun with fewer? More fun with fewer. Yes. Cleaning is my love language or cleaning is my nightmare. I would say it's, I like things to be clean, but I don't <laughs> really like cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. That is it. That is it. Okay. Here for humor or please be serious. I like to be serious, but I appreciate when other people are funny. Okay. Got it. All right. So we're not going to see any like silly reels on your Instagram anytime soon. I've been trying to get into TikTok. So maybe I just think I'm like, I'm more of a serious person and my humor, I think can be like, unless you know me really well, it's like hard to get my humor. Okay. Fair enough. Well, now I'm curious about that. Like I I think I can describe, I think I'm funny, but I don't think it's funny to other people. And so (laughs) I'd rather (laughs) just be serious. Like I crack (laughs) myself up. Yeah. I love that. All right. Another segment. So I'm going to just shoot these off rapid fire. A couple quick questions. What is a recent read? I just read made, which it's an old, it's not a new book, but it's a memoir about a woman who was in an abusive relationship. She got pregnant. She ended up becoming homeless and she became a housekeeper to make ends meet for her and her daughter. And it's all about like 
class and hard work. And she also describes like, you know, what is happiness? Like, can money buy happiness? Like, you know, what is it like being in the system for government assistance? Mm. It was fascinating. I thought it was so well written and I loved it. I listened to the audiobook and she narrates it, which I also love. Yes. Oh, yes. When the author does the narrating. Ooh, yes. It's the taps. And I'm almost done with Bill Bryson's The Body, mm. which I thought was going to be super dry. It's blowing my mind. I'm like obsessed with it. I want to go back and listen to it again. It's so good. Interesting. Yeah. You know what? I love that you said you picked something up that wasn't necessarily a new release. I think sometimes we have that pressure of like, what's, what's right now? Like what's everybody reading right now? But you can like go back. Oh yeah. To be fair, yeah. I picked it up because Netflix made it into a series. So I was like, well, I want to read the book before I watch yeah. the series. But I like, I use my library card a lot for audiobooks, And so usually the new books, the waiting lists are like week, you know, months long. And so I like going back and reading old or listening to old books. Yes. I love the library apps. So I use Libby and Hoopla. Yes. Are those the ones? Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's always the challenge. Like you see that a book is on hold. It's going to be six months or something. And it's like, do I go over to Audible? Do I sit tight? Yep, yep. <laughs> it's forever the challenge. Okay, what's something that's a favorite right now? Like something maybe you bought or you've been using a lot that you're loving? I just got um, a new, like, I think it's, a, it's like a makeup serum. It's kind of like a mix of everything. So it's Ooh. your foundation and a moisturizer in one from Ilia. I did it for a sponsored post and I really historically struggled to find like a good shade of foundation. Mm -hmm. This thing like magically morphs to your skin tone. So even when you put it on, it doesn't look perfect. And then mm -hmm. 30 seconds later, you're, it like develops and it's a perfect match. I don't get it, but I'm obsessed. <laughs> That sounds like a fun little experiment. Now I want to try it just to like see this all go down. Yeah, it's the serum. It's their new serum. It's amazing. All right, cool. All right, what's one thing we'll never see you do? You know, I never want to say never, but I'll probably uh, never do like a reality TV show. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Mm. I like to be in control of like what I edit, you know, what I put out there. And I don't feel like I'd have that with the show. Now, you know, like Bravo is going to call and say, we're developing uh, bloggers of the Northeast and we want to feature you. And you're going to be like, are you kidding me? Here's the thing I did. <laughs> I've gone down that route before. And I think that's why I know it's not. Oh, you have. My goodness. Okay. It's wild. But we did, a few of us did a sizzle reel for a production company and it was getting shopped around to networks. This was like uh -huh. back when girls was a huge show. And so they were oh, kind of gosh. making it like the real life girls but they, we were all bloggers at, or influencers. Mm -hmm. When I watched the sizzle reel back mm -hmm. now, granted, they made me out <laughs> to be like a really like snotty, uh, not snotty is not the right word, but like so serious that I was just kind of like a wet blanket, which it's not so far from like what I'm like in real life. <laughs> <laughs> I just came off as like very, yeah type A, which I am, but it just didn't look the same on screen because they just exaggerate it so much. And I was like, I don't know if this is for me. And because that yeah. is my personality. I'm like, you have to like dramatize that. And I'm like, yeah, it works when I'm just myself because that is who I am. But like when you start editing it and like oh, dramatizing yeah. it, it doesn't feel the same. And I was like, I don't know if I want to be like, I'd rather be that than like, you know, a terrible pr person or like, you know, a party or something, but it was like, yeah. uh, I look so boring. <laughs> Does that give you empathy for other characters in reality TV? Like thinking they might have a bad edit? Well, now I can just like tell when things are edited because mm -hmm. like they'll show people in, in, in an interview, but then they'll cut to another like B-roll shot. Yeah. And the sound sounds slightly different and they're uh -huh. definitely piecing together words to make it sound like they're saying something else, like <laughs> full sentences. Nightmare. Like, but if, you know, if you don't see someone say the sentence straight through, they didn't say it straight through. No way. And so I'm like, because they would have shown it for impact. Yep. Uh -huh. And so when they cut, you know, when you're watching below deck, which is my favorite reality, guilty pleasure TV show, uh -huh. 
and they're showing someone sitting in like the room doing the interview and then they cut to like you know the b-roll of the water on the outside Mm -hmm. it's not the same shot with the voiceover wow now i'm gonna be paying like extra close attention to this happening oh yeah and like it'll the voice will change just enough like it won't sound like it flows 100 percent, and like oh it's all edited (laughs) oh goodness I, it just makes me want to go like check something out right now. I'm a bachelor yep. person, but <laughs> yes. Okay. So last question, do you have an amp song right now? Something that you love to listen to for working out or just like getting super focused with work? Hmm. I, I really don't listen to a ton of music, but I like putting on the Spotify focus genre ah classical, okay I like the classical interpretations of like pop songs that are current it's just like yeah. someone playing piano I'm in for that not that exciting from an amp perspective you can see why I might not be so great on a reality tv show but that oh is my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> no I love that I think I mean I think especially for those of those of us who work alone We are always sort of like trying to create our own version of company, you know, like a little coffee shop feeling. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like having good tunes that aren't distracting is a thing like that's nice. So I think that's actually really great advice. So I'm going to look it up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming to hang out and sharing about your book again out business minded November 23rd everyone needs to run and grab their copy um I can't wait to get like an actual physical copy in my hands but I'm so excited <laughs> yes yes and read both parts everyone both halves yes. both important and do the worksheets <laughs> yes don't be afraid to mark up that book I know like exactly. sometimes I get hesitant right with the pen but yeah just go for it just jump in there All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just had a blast talking to Carly. I hope you had so much fun listening. Don't wait to pre-order or buy your copy of Business Minded out November 23rd. And if you want to keep in touch with Carly, she is an absolute pleasure to follow along with on Instagram. And her handle is extremely simple. It's just at Carly. Thank you for tuning in. And if you enjoyed your time with us today, please share the episode with a friend, then subscribe, follow, leave a comment, or give a five-star review. Season one of the show will include more chats with top authors, experts, and influential personalities. We will be serving up simplified applied psychology, habit theory, and quality of life tips and tricks that you can put into action right away. Until next week, I'm Kate Hammer, and you know how to live.